So this whole business of housing and multiple occupation and the plans that Harlow Council have, the proposals, when did you first hear about this? To be honest, we heard in the grapevine that it was going to go in a direction for an Article 4, um, but that would obviously have to be published with 12 months to make everyone aware. Um, it was only really on, is it Wednesday evening when the Cabinet, Yeah. when that was, that is when I found out about it. So it's all come more or less a bit of a shock? Overnight, really. So yeah. it feels that way for, for a lot of us. So, Owen, you, you were at the meeting as well, weren't I you? I was, yeah. yeah. So, when you looked at that council document, mm -hmm. did you understand fully what it was saying? Uh, uh, yeah, I think I did. <laughs> I think it was, came as a shock to, to, to myself and everybody else. It was almost a, a culling of existing landlords in the area without real um, any guidance given to us prior to that. So, there's. So how many yeah, meetings, how many meetings, if any, have you had with council officers mm. or the people who have been elected by the people of councillors? No. Any? No. no. None? I had no knowledge of this until two or three days prior to the, the, the cabinet meeting. Uh, and then when we were at the cabinet meeting, it was, it was pretty conclusive that, that the uh, legislation had been passed. Because so. you're, you know, landlords, companies, you all seem to be quite, you know, quite a tight knit bunch. So we didn't thought it not that difficult like we are here today and just for the purpose of the camera there are other people here in the bill in the office just to call you all to, to do this really couldn't you got a councillor to sit here yeah. and speak to you all yeah absolutely definitely yeah so that must be disappointing yeah it is really because obviously we've, we've got houses being refurbished at the moment we've got not only landlords you know we've got expected tenants who are moving in to businesses in harlow and now where are they going to go if this happens in this short amount of time um in no indication, I don't, I think the Article 4, we've been reasoning if we get enough time, there can only be a certain amount of HMOs, but landlords who invested a lot of their money, it's not only going to affect them, it's going to affect tenants, it's going to affect their families, so everyone else does have lives as well. Is there anything, either of you can answer this question, is there anything that you've seen in those documents or will be discussed that you think is reasonable or say, yeah, I agree with that? Yeah, I, I think invoking Article Four in a in a twelve month period puts uh puts certainly slows down if not puts a cap on the the, the HMOs that are being built in town, uh, and I think it's needed. Uh, I, and can we just explain to to readers and viewers what that means in Article Four, etc. Uh, Article Four is a, a blanket ban of uh, the creation of future HMOs from that point forward, and almost a cap of how many are in in the area that's covered by the Article Four directive. So I think. Are we, and people might look at this and say, hold on, supply and demand. Yeah. Like, is there a demand for rooms, for places? Well, Absolutely. we're looking after over 400. We've got over 600 tenants, probably. We've housed over 5,000, more than likely, in Harlow. And we've got two rooms ready on our ball to let. So, so you've got 400 me, rooms, you've got two, two, two to let. Two vacant. There okay. is a huge demand. Um, we're getting calls every day. And we were housing about five people a day. So it's showing to us that the demand is there, and if the demand is there, where are these? If this goes totally wrong, what the council's intentions are, where is that going to lead these tenants? So we deal with vulnerable tenants, streets to homes, streets to homes, our local charity. We work closely. We, I even personally work closely with Harlow Council. Um, you know, they do a fantastic job on the HMOs, um, but we just like a little bit more notice if this is coming in because we've put a lot of effort to get these houses up and running. So you mentioned Street to Homes, you got an, an award in the, in the, in the, door, in the window did, there. So, what, so, so yeah. what, what is your relationship with Streets to Homes? So uh, there's a lot of people, obviously, you know, not, not just in Harlow, they're stereotyping it totally. This is within everywhere. You know, we've got people who have depression, you know, anxiety, uh, divorces, drug addiction. Um, being the only agent, we deal with universal credit and the benefits. A lot of people don't open their doors to them. So here, because we're working with the providers, we give them the opportunity to get back into a stable environment and help them. And we have helped people, you know, who are now full time in working. It was at, you know, when we met them on the floor, you know, they're now working and moving on with their lives. Mm. You may not be able to answer this, but why is there such a concentration of certain streets have a lot of HMOs, you know, like Hyde's, Lady Shot? Bearcroft, is it just the nature of the, the way that those houses are built? Sure. Townhouses, yeah. etc. Of course. I mean, you don't... Minimum amount of refurbishment yeah, you... and, and, and yeah. alterations to make them live in the size, isn't it? Lady yeah, Shot is, is designed, you know, the spacing for HMO, which obviously, again, makes them have better living because they've got bigger bigger rooms. Now we can go and get smaller properties in Harlow where they're going to have shoe boxes as, as rooms, 
but not only that, they've only just bought out last year the regs for the size of the room. So we followed the HMO li licenses, the guidance of them, yeah. to get these licenses. So when people refer to them now, they're working to that license to now be told. Um, the lady in the covenant decided to tell me only yesterday that no applications will not be being made. We don't know if that's an error, and now we, we don't know what to do. What's the worst case scenario, Owen? Um, worst case scenario now is that if they they invoke the the, the covenants across all of all of Harlow or anyone that's got the covenants applied to their houses, people like me and, and certainly other people in this room are at least part way through their their financing. They've either exchanged or in my position they've completed. Then they they refurbished it. Um, they've put in thirty forty thousand pounds worth of refurbishment. They brought it up to a very good standard um, and followed all the, the protocols from the Environment Agency at the, at the local council. Uh, and now we're in a position where there will be no licence. So worst case scenario is houses then, or across the, across the town, are turned back into to single lit dwellings. Um, which is going to put, if it's clearly got over four to 600 people, there's about 1,800 people at the moment that, that rent rooms in, in town, and that demand is going up. But the stock is going to go down. How how is that going to help the the rest of the people coming into the town who can't afford to have a, a single dwelling? It's it's a big question. Do Certainly, it's for me. Do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I think it's reasonable where there's there's roads at the moment and there is a lot there. Then obviously you've got to look into that by every single application. Um, it can't just be judged and the worst thing that really gets me I have to put my point out here is all we get is issues with parking now a lot of our people in our properties do not even drive so if they're four bedroom houses they can have a family who's got three cars now ours we, when I'm doing their applications I'm very strict on saying who drives we try and allow two cars to each property because we don't want to upset the neighbours we're here to work with them but a lot of that when I go you know dealing with the council a lot of people's issue is parking, but in HMOs, that is the least worry for us because mm. they don't drive half of them. Yeah, I think it needs regulating for sure. I mean, if if the if the the, the council can set up some form of regulation where further inspections happen, uh, additional bin services are catered for, and you know maybe a raising council tax on HMOs, then things can improve. They're, they're, we're not saying there's not room for improvement because there is. We're just saying that there needs to be needs to be looked at before it's just cut back, and it certainly needs to be discussed with landlords in the town. I know of myself ten or fifteen landlords locally that had no knowledge of this, and that no one's had any communication over it. So, if if we could get some advice or, or some guidelines to follow, then then we would gladly work with the council on it. So, would you like perhaps to act as a delegation and go to the council office, as opposed to just turning up to a meeting and suddenly what's this? Actually, a delegation and go to see the council and, yeah. and take it from there. For sure. Yeah, I mean, if we can work with the council to, to keep the houses as, as they are, maybe even add more additional houses if there is a, a, a demand for it, but regulate those houses with the council's guidance, then it's a win-win all round and everyone's looked after, as well as the tenants that are soon to be without homes. How robust are you at keeping on top of your may I ask, HMOs? You know, when you, I know there's a, a, there's a whiteboard behind us here and it has things like, Fridge and rubbish, rubbish and all. Yeah, is that something you're on top of all the time? All the time. I mean, we've got someone who goes around on certain days just to monitor our rubbish. Um, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, saying we don't get a complaint. We have a large number of HMOs in Harlow, so obviously we're going to get more complaints than everyone as an agent. Um, but as far as we're concerned, we're working really closely with the council. If they tell us to get that rubbish removed, we do it that day. Mm -hmm. Now. <coughs> no one could be any quicker than that and you are going to get problems we hardly have any antisocial behavior and um, a good job is where we've got a lot of properties as well if one tenant doesn't work somewhere we will then move them over to somewhere when they're not with that person so we've got the accommodation to do that if we don't get the accommodation you know then we have to go down the rules of then getting them out through the court which then takes months and then where are they going to go because after they've been here it's their final they've got nowhere else to go apart from a tent really you know, but but not all HMOs are just for the for the people from streets for homes or homeless people. I mean, there, there's people in this room, myself included, that do high end professional HMOs, all on suites. You know, almost boutique, room by room living. That's the way that the the markets have turned these days. The cost of a room compared to the cost of a a flat is is, is their price is all in. So they've got their whole prices all in. They know exactly what they're going to pay for the month. 
their maintenance issues are dealt with straight away. Yep. You know, absolutely, they're on the phone instantly that something's wrong. They've got people around to sort it much quicker than a, any other, um, you know, you having to phone anybody else up. Um, and that's what they, you know, the generation's been growing to like live, live like in the professional side of the... So that sounds a bit like the office blocks where nobody really talks about the ones next to the railway station, the Pearson's mm. old building, which is now, you know, mm. very b bespoke, etc. Mm. Or indeed at Gu um, South Road on Fettenborough Way, yeah. which has, you know, so it's a very much you're saying, you tar are we tiring HMOs in the I, same I brush? Think, I think it's a very negative outlook on yeah. HMOs. People see them as... as uh, there's divey places where people are, aren't respectful of the neighbourhood and I don't think that's generally the case across the board. There are, there are road tenants and, and it's, Keely's a managing agent for, for 400 plus rooms in town and her job and, and the rest of her guys' job is to deal with the, the problems the tenants have. So if it's regulated properly and, and built well on a good business model and, and in a way that people are looked after at a good quality of you know, product at a decent price, then who's losing? That's that's the concern there. And so stamps have gone up a lot in recent years as well. Yeah, they're not stamps. quite the dive anymore. Yeah. No, yeah. I, mean, I think also because of the number of new HMOs that there have been in recent years, it's increased competition between landlords to pull the tenants in, which has pushed up standards. Policy. Yeah, definitely, oh, definitely, definitely. A lot of houses have had major refurbs. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some what are more outdated than others. You know, um, but we have worked alongside them to try and get them up, you know, just to a better to a living standard, and we have. We should and be we, a set of guidelines, yeah. shouldn't they, Kayleigh? Do you think? We, yeah. That is what the licensing's for. So when the licenses come round and you've got objects, you know, which are not satisfactory, you've got a time period to get them done yeah. um, and upgrade whatever you need to upgrade. And, and for me, as an agent, not a landlord, that is good for me because I want to be managing houses to a decent quality for my tenants. So if anything, I'm the person behind it pushing for refurbs um, but a lot of landlords to be honest who I do work with now are you know are good landlords and they do want to get their properties up to standard to get their rents in that they should be achieving and they, the tenants should be looked after mm -hmm. they're not animals they're human beings and to attract the better tenants yeah. as well with right. standards well we all want the better tenants because it's an easier lifestyle for, mm -hmm. for them it's a better quality of tenant for us so we're not out outwardly looking for for road tenants, unfortunately we do get them because it's sometimes at the cheaper end of the market, but when they're in, we, we, we deal with it and we move them on if they have to be moved on or we can work with them to improve. Yeah. So finally, uh, if we could say, do you have a final final request from, from to, to Harlow Council at the end of this interview, what, what was your request to Harlow Council? Um, just, just think about the homelessness in Harlow. Um, we are here to give them an opportunity and I really feel that, you know, the service that landlords are offering Harlow um, are doing that and we've had HMOs, unfortunately, then, you know, there's going to be nothing for them. Where will these tenants go? Where will you know, exactly? they will be at a local town centre, that is the truth, and a lot of them people from that town centre, we have had them in our rooms, so they will have nowhere to go. Okay. I've, I've got a list, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> yes. <Indulgent laughs> yes, certainly. Um, so... I'll read it out word for word. Yeah, mind. sure. Uh, so with the implementation of enforcement of the covenants on the 27th of Feb 2020 that is being used as a tool to stop the creation of further HMOs whilst they wait for a 12-month uh, time period uh, as a directive for Article 4 to be implemented. Uh, the questions I've got are directly for, for the council and um, on behalf of myself and, and other landlords locally. Um, landlords who are either completing their purchase midway through licensing or have completed their purchases with tenants now in situ as, as part of the requirements, um, who, are, who have been declined their license, what are the financial implications for those that are stuck in there and what are they to do with the tenants that are now having to find additional housing? Question two, the HMOs in Harlow are usually fully occupied and there is still a very significant demand in the area. With the closed door policy, what, is, uh, what proposals are to be made to deal with the high number of prospective tenants who cannot afford to rent full homes? Question three, you bear with me. Um, if Article 4 has to have a compulsory transition period of 12 months to avoid the risk of compensation for those directly affected, then why has the implementation of enforcement and covenants not been given a compulsory transition period also? Uh, there are hundreds of HMOs locally with this covenant in place, and what will happen to these? Um, 
as there will be potentially countless claims from lost funds from investors and countless um, tenants who will be looking for additional homing. Uh, surely a minimum of three to six month transition period from the date of the enforcement of Covenant would be a more sensible route for those that are financially invested or are now potentially stuck in, in the new legislation. There are currently over 1,800 tenants who benefit from the rooms supplied by Harlow Landlords. Myself, Keely, as you know, has got 400 plus. Um, and this number is increasing. The government is not reaching the quota for the 300,000 home shortfall, and with the implementation of this covenant, this will further restrict not only HMO developments, but garden developments for new builds to be added to Harlow stock, um, and the use of mixed homes. Surely this is totally counterproductive to the shortfall of homes locally. Um, well, I'd just like to know the, the council's reasoning and how they're going to combat that. Um, and the last one, if there has been a strict enforcement of the single use covenant from all HMO applications, why have certain landlords been granted their applications who have the covenant in situ, whilst other landlords who have applied beforehand have, with the same covenant been declined theirs? Either this is a case of selective discrimination um, or it's they are uh, favouring certain applications over others. I'd like to know the reasoning behind that as well. 